Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be presenting in this uh, platform online seminar series. Uh, this is joint work with Alex White and Sean Wu. Oops. All right, good. So there's a big public debate about big tech and every other person that you may encounter will tell you that how they are worried about big tech being so dominant and getting all our information and will be just going to be ruling our, uh, all our lives. Um, uh, here is, is a pattern of debate about the big tech, the concerns about big tech. Some people will say, well, we need to break up these big tech companies, say Facebook. And then somebody else will say, well, do we really want two Facebooks instead of one? Uh, how about instead we regulate them? And then people will be asking questions like, do we really think regulation will improve things? Will that lead to some unintended consequences? Okay. And, um, you know, our field economics is actually well suited to uh, address questions of this sort. In particular, economics of platforms can address questions of the sort. What level of market concentration is optimal? Can competition policy interventions help? And what are the likely effects of regulation? And these are sort of the, 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 the broader questions. In this project, what we want to do is we want to ask uh, whether competition or um, a specific type of regulation that we will call interoperability alleviate dominance. And in doing so, we are going to offer a modeling approach uh, that will be useful to answer these questions in the platform form context, but also that may be useful to answer other related questions in the platform context. So we're going to offer a tractable model. And since we're gonna be looking at dominance issues, uh, we need a model that can handle asymmetries. And what I'll do in this talk is I'll present the net fee model. I'll uh, show our propositions regarding uh, how competition may increase dominance and how interoperability regulation can decrease dominance. Good, so we're gonna look at a model where there are J platforms and an outside option. Each user will make a choice of joining a platform or just choosing the outside option. For the sake of this talk, I'm going to present you the model with only one side in each platform. So there won't be uh, males and females. There won't be buyers and sellers, okay? Everyone is on one side of the platform. In the paper, we actually present the model with multiple sides and we have our results, some of our results uh, with multiple sides. For the sake of this talk, I'll focus on a single-sided platforms. <clears throat> users, I'll have a bunch of users and each user will be identified with a vector of membership values theta. What this means is that this vector will tell me the payoff I will get, uh, I will enjoy from joining a platform. Okay, theta J will denote that payoff from joining platform J. Uh, there will also be an outside option, theta not will denote the membership, uh, the value I will enjoy from not joining to any uh, platform. Joining a platform will give user theta utility that is equal to the membership value plus a component that measures the externality benefits that come from possible interactions in the platform minus all the payments made to the platform. So we're going to, the, the externality component here will be a linear function of the number of users in the platform. There will be a platform specific interaction value parameter, gamma J. And the more is the number of people that are using the platform, the higher the externality benefits will be if gamma is positive. Okay. Very good. And now here is the sort of, the net fee structure, okay? The, comp the, the competition conduct uh, of our model. And uh, this is what is highlighted in the title. So, so this is going to be an important concept for us. Uh, the 
platforms in our model will be competing by what we call net fees. Okay. A net fee is what a user uh, pays to the platform in addition to other payments that uh, the user makes that are related to externality payments. Okay. In particular, the total price that a user pays to the platform will be the sum of the net fees plus all of the externality benefits. So what this implies is that if a user is contemplating on joining a platform, then her payoff from joining the platform, her net payoff from joining the platform will be her membership value minus the net fee. Okay. Now, uh, let me a little bit motivate what, what this means, okay? So in general, pricing strategies of platforms can take a very complicated form, okay? They can be, uh, they can be quite arbitrary. There are platforms where we pay fees for just signing up to the platform. Think about mesh.com. Okay? There are platforms where we pay fees uh, for signing up to the platform and then we may be paying fees based on every interaction that we have on the platform. Okay. Some, some ride apps may be examples of this. Furthermore, these payments that we make, uh, the users make to the platform can be quite dynamic and complicated. They may depend on various factors like the frequency of interactions at that very moment in the platform. Okay. So obviously this, this Pricing strategies are going to take a very complicated form. Uh, well, we make some abstractions uh, to uh, simplify these prices, to both simplify these pricing strategies and also to focus on certain aspects of these pricing strategies. Okay? In our model, our firms are using this signing up membership fee as the only strategic component or the only strategic variable in their, um, in their strategies, yeah? And we are assuming that all of the externality uh, benefits that are created in the platform will be extracted by the platform. I see there are some chats, so what do I do here, Greg? Uh, yes, so one question is whether you could give an example or two of how people should think about the membership value. Um, what sort of platform should we have in mind, I guess? Right, so these are the values that you enjoy from just being on the platform itself, okay? Sometimes I go to a platform and, um, right. So you can think of these as, you know, I, I uh, I, I, for example, joined to the uh, to my phone company. So let me think about it. So what is it? Uh, let, let me try to think about a good example. Hmm. Very good. So imagine the choice between uh, the video consoles, okay, game consoles. You can think of these membership values as the comparative value of joining to one platform versus the other one. And also I can do a lot of things that are like communicating with my friends on the game console, okay? So that could be an example of a membership value. Thanks. Uh, and then we have two other quick questions, if we could. Um, so Heskey asks, is this a static model? And Doshin asks whether the net fee is equivalent to a quality adjusted price. So, right. So the, the first answer is that uh, this is a static model. It's not a dynamic model. Okay, the, 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 uh, uh, but right. And uh, what was the second question again? Uh, whether we can think of the net fee as a quality adjusted price. Quality adjusted price. What do you mean by quality adjusted price? Um, I, I guess what is meant is if we take the price and subtract from it the quality, then what is left is the net fee. Um, it seems to be what you have on the slide there. 
Um, where, where I think of quality as being the network uh, benefits of the, that are specific to the platform. Yeah, I don't really see it as a quality adjusted uh, price in that way. I just see it as a membership fee or um, some fee that uh, sort of the net pay of that will be left to the user. Okay. Sounds good? Yep, good. thanks. <clears throat> sure, thank you. So here is the timing of the model. Platforms simultaneously post net fees and that demand will be realized based on the user's choices. Uh, and then the profits will be realized. <clears throat> now, so here is what will be, uh, what will be sort of um, important in the firm's, uh, firm's uh, profit maximizing problem. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the demand, okay? So when a user chooses which platform to join, the user's payoff from joining platform J is just going to be per membership value minus the net fee. In particular, the user's payoff from joining the platform will be independent of other users' platform choices. So this makes the demand calculation in our model uh, a very straightforward demand uh, system calculation, okay? This is going to be a standard um, discrete choice problem. So given a net fee vector, we can calculate the demand vector. Okay. Now, the second thing is that now let's write down the profits earned by platform J. The platform uh, profits will be uh, the demand, the second term, multiplied by the marginal profit. The marginal profit will have the net fees, the externality payments extracted from the user minus the marginal cost. So what I want to highlight here is that the externalities will impact the firm's profit via affecting their marginal profit, okay? So the marginal profit will include terms related to the demand in the firm's uh, demand for firm. Now, when we do the, the, do the profit maximization from J, uh, it's a pretty straightforward exercise algebraically. We arrive at the following formula, okay? What this says is the following. So the, the, the optimal net fee will be composed of three components. The first one is the marginal cost. The second one is the standard uh, differentiated Bertrand market power. And the third term is what we will call uh, externality discount, okay? So this is algebraically very straightforward, but let me sort of explain to you the idea behind this. Uh, let's do the following thought experiment where the, uh, the platform is contemplating on increasing its net fee, okay? Now, the first, uh, sorry, uh, increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing its net fee in order to attract an additional user. Okay. Now let's see what are the costs of doing this uh, exercise. Well, first there will be an increase in the marginal cost, okay? Uh, there, there will be an additional marginal cost due to this user. The second term will capture the fact that the platform will need to decrease its net fee in order to attract this additional user. Now the third term is going to be the externality benefits because uh, we have this uh, new user. But as you can see, there's a two in front of it. Where is this two coming from? Now, if I am decreasing my net fee in order to attract Alex, uh, now first Alex will also uh, enjoy a lot of externality benefits here and I will be extracting them. So that's one. Moreover, all of my existing users will have an increase in their externality payments because there is now an additional user in the platform. Okay. What I want to highlight here is that the, uh, the externality discount is increasing in the market demand and more so with higher externality uh, interaction value gamma. And we're going to look at pure strategy national equilibrium where 
is going to be a net fee profile where each firm will maximize their profits given others' net fees. Greg, I see. Yes, some uh, so two more background. questions. Um, I guess the first question could be put as, um, do you allow gamma to be negative? So can there be negative network effects? It can be, it is allowed in general, yeah. Um, and uh, Luis uh, asked- But I will um, focus on, sorry, but I will focus on gamma positive in my policy analysis. Um, Luis asked whether you have a result or assumption that guarantees uniqueness of demand, uh, given that we have network effects here. Excuse me? Um, so, so do we know that the demand is unique? Uh, you know, sometimes in models with network effects, you have equilibria where nobody joins. Right. Uh, so in our model, demand is well-defined and unique uh, because of the net fee contact. That's the advantage of the net fee contact. Okay. So a user knows uh, the payoff that the user will get from joining any platform, and then the user just goes to the payoff maximizing platform. Thank you. Very good. Now, so this is the model. Now let me go to some analysis, okay? Our analysis. Uh, the first one will be about the relationship between competition and dominance. Uh, the second one will be about the relationship between interoperability at specific type of um, regulation and dominance. Now, I want to briefly argue <clears throat> why we focus on dominance. Uh, well, the first one is that people talk about dominance. This is something that people worry about or wonder about. And we want to be able to have a model that says something about dominance. Uh, second one is that there may be some unmodeled implications of dominance that people are worried about. Okay? We are writing down these static models and we may want to worry that well, dominance may have some long-term implications on um, on our lives. And you know, it's it's not unheard that sometimes people make uh, claims or uh, sentences of the following form: Once the platform is dominant in one market, it will also dominate other markets. When AI is advanced, these companies will start ruling our lives. Okay. So we're going to take dominance as a separate issue, as, a, an, as an issue on its own, and we're gonna look at the relationship between competition and dominance and this regulation and dominance. Okay. By dominance, I mean um, a market having a large market, uh, a firm having a large market share. Good, for the analysis, I'm going to, I'm going to assume the demand is logic, so we are allowing uh, outside option and Z will uh, capture the attractiveness of the outside option here. Uh, platforms are going to be ex ante identical for this exercise that I'm doing. I promise you that I will be, this model can uh, handle asymmetries and we'll see where the asymmetries will come in. Okay. And we're gonna normalize the marginal cost to be zero. And here is our first proposition, okay? Let me explain it to you uh, with the graph first. So here, what we are uh, doing is we're looking at all equilibria of the triopoly model and all of the equilibria of the duopoly model. And we are looking, we are going to compare the largest possible market share of any platform in any equilibrium in both models and we want to see how they compare with each other. So first, let me say that if you look at interaction values gamma that are less than 2.61, then in both models, we have a unique equilibrium. These are different equilibria, of course. They are going to be symmetric equilibria. So in the triopoly model, in the unique equilibrium, each firm will have one third of the market share. In the duopoly model, each firm will have half of the market share. Okay. Now, if we keep increasing gamma, say to 2.7, uh, 
then the duopoly model will continue to have a unique equilibrium. Each firm will get half of the market share. Okay, I just want to make sure you are able to. Is there a question or shall I continue? Uh, I think Gary just had his microphone unmuted. Okay. Um, please okay. 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 So the duopoly model still has a unique equilibrium. On the other side, the triopoly model will start admitting a new type of equilibrium where there's a large firm and there are two smaller firms. And the large firms market share is larger than one third. As I keep increasing gamma, now the larger firms market share keeps rising. At some point around three, the duopoly model starts admitting a new asymmetric equilibrium where there's a large market, a large firm, and there's a smaller firm. Okay. And this proposition will say that, uh, the you know the tri the largest possible market share uh, of any firm in the triopoly model will be larger than that in the duopoly model. Okay. Now, what this implies is the following: Suppose initially the interaction value gamma is three point twenty five, let's say, and we have a duopoly model. And there is a large firm that, ca that captures two thirds of the market and a small firm that captures one third of the market. And people are worried about it, about the dominance in this market. And they argue that let's bring in a new firm, let's increase competition. What this result says is that when we go to a triopoly model by bringing in a new firm, it could be the case that actually dominance gets stronger. Okay. So I'd like to give you some intuition about what is going on here. And I'll give you the intuition by giving you one more proposition first, okay? And in this proposition, I'm, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna look at a model with an outside option and a monopolist and an outside option and two symmetric firms and I will compare them. Essentially, why is this a sort of a nice benchmark to give to a study and give an intuition about the other result is that you can think of the onside option as a, as a firm, as a platform, who cannot do a strategic choices, who cannot choose a net fee, okay? So it's not going to react to other changes um, mm. that other platforms will do, okay? And the result here is that there's a, there's a value of, there's an interval of outside option parameters such that when you go from monopoly to duopoly, the total demand in the market will go down. So outside option will start attracting more uh, users. Okay? And this is a little bit perhaps counterintuitive in, uh, in, in non-platform markets where we think of uh, going to duopoly will increase the market size. So now let me uh, convey the intuition in this symmetric market, in the symmetric model, okay? So recall the pricing formula, okay? So in a nutshell, the arguments will be of the following form. Well, when I bring in a new additional firm to the market, uh, it's gonna first have, a, have an initial shock to the system, initial impact of lowering the uh, market uh, lowering the demands for each of the existing firms. Okay. Well, lowering the demand will imply a lower externality discount. Remember the the last term externality discount uh, is increasing in the market share in the demand. Uh, but then this means that uh, there will be an upward pressure on the net fees and the equilibrium net fees will be larger and the total demand will be lower. Now, of course, this is, this is a very simplifying uh, intuition. There are two caveats here. The first caveat is the following. That's not on the slide. If you look at the second term, the market power term, it is also proportional to the market uh, to the demand for platform J. Okay. 
So all these arguments that I've been saying about the uh, external discount going down will also make the market power go, to go down. But it's also linear in the market demand. That's why I need a large gamma so that an increase in the demand or a, a decrease in the demand implies a lower, uh, uh, an upward pressure on the net fees. Okay, so large gamma is needed uh, for this reason that the, the externality discount is the dominant, uh, uh, dominant term. There's a second caveat, which is that when I bring in a new firm, it may very well be the case that there is now an increase in the match qualities. So the outside option becomes less attractive. So the total demand in the market may also go up. That's why we need to restrict attention to an interval of outside options, okay? It's not a global uh, argument. Okay. But I think it conveys the intuition here. All right, good. Now. Let me tell you how this, how to think about uh, the issue of bringing in a new firm, a uh, new platform to the market and how we arrive at a sort of a new equilibrium. Okay. Suppose initially we are, uh, we have the interaction value parameter in the range where the duopoly model has a unique equilibrium. Now I'm bringing in a new platform and I want to invite you to a thought experiment where we're gonna start an iterative process of sort of best replies of firms in a hand wavy way, not in a formal iterative process, but in a hand wavy way, think about this iterative process where initially the, exist, the additional firm eats the user base of one of the existing firms, okay? The new firm eats the user base of the one of the existing firms. So the initial market share configuration is um, one firm gets half of the market share and the other two firms are splitting the market share, the remaining market share. Now the smaller firms will have lower externality discounts. So their net fees will tend to go up. If their net fees are tending to go up, their market shares will go down. This market share will go somewhere. It will go to the dominant firm. The dominant firm will get an even higher market share. Higher market share will imply a, a higher externality discount, so lower net fee, and so an increase in the uh, market share. And so we have a process that is going to convert somewhere. And that somewhere is, the, is an asymmetric equilibrium with a larger market share for the dominant firm. Greg, I see, before I go to interoperability, I see uh, some uh, action on the chat. Yes, there's some help. I don't read them, I just see read over there. Um, at the moment, people are discussing sort of big picture issues. So what I suggest is we wait until the end um, so that you can make some progress with the, the presentation and then we can talk about interpretations of the model, if that's okay. Sounds good, sounds good, thank you. Okay. so. What we have seen right now is that, well, adding competition may, may backfire if, uh, if you were worried that, oh, we are in a, in, a, in a duopoly where we have dominance issues and we are gonna bring in someone, some new firm, and then it may backfire, okay? It may actually make dominance stronger. But some people argue that uh, perhaps regulation is a better alternative. And one popular idea is interoperability. So we're gonna use our model to, uh, to, to do an analysis of uh, interoperability issue. Interoperability refers to the issue where, um, you know, technically we're gonna allow users across different platforms to, to be able to interact with each other and enjoy these externality benefits. Um, so can I just slip in one substantive question from Heskey who, asked whether this sort of dominance is definitely bad news for consumers um, or might they benefit? Very good, good. I think that's a very good question. It is not. You can imagine dominance being uh, driven by lower net fees. And so consumers may be better off. Although the welfare is not always being better for the consumers. 
because the other firms, uh, the smaller firms, net fees are going up. In general, one can actually, while here, let me talk a little bit about welfare here. Uh, we have thought about the welfare. Uh, one thing that comes up in our model is that we know these equilibrium. Okay, and we can calculate the welfare. Okay, there's nothing that prevents us from computing the welfare here computationally. It's just we cannot have a closed form expression for the welfare, and we don't get very crisp results on whether welfare goes up or down. Um, what is in the way, essentially, but the, the main difficulty is that, as I mentioned earlier, when we bring in a new firm, we also increase the match values between the buyers and the firms, and that makes the calculation sort of a little bit messy or having a crisp result um, not easy to get. But I want to emphasize that one can calculate the welfare, okay? But we still take the, we are now kind of taking dominance as an issue on its own, just because it is, people are talking about it. Good. So let me introduce you the, our approach to interoperability. So we're gonna, I'm gonna in, introduce a new parameter lambda. This is a number between zero and one. It's going to um, denote the degree of interoperability across the platforms. Okay, how, how much I can enjoy the benefits that would accrue in terms of uh, from interacting with others uh, in other platforms. Okay. So a user theta j, when contemplating on platform J will enjoy the following utility. She's going to get her membership value. She's going to get her externality benefits uh, from interacting with users on platform J. There's a new term here. Uh, this term is going to be the externality benefits that one could generate on platform K and the, whole, the total amount of externalities one could uh, enjoy on all other platforms, but they are going to be discounted by this interoperability parameter lambda, uh, minus the total payments made to platform J. Okay. Now we are going to extend the notion of net fee to this environment by assuming a particular competition conduct, okay, where uh, the net fee here will be, again, any payment that is made to the platform in addition to all of the externality related payments, okay? It's going to be, uh, so we're going to uh, also, the firm will also extract all the benefits that are coming from uh, interactions with the other users of other platforms. I do the same exercise of demand and then profits given this, uh, given this, um, uh, given the model's uh, assumptions. Again, calculating the first order conditions um, is a straightforward algebraic exercise. Compared to my previous pricing formula, what I'm going to have is that the coefficient in front of the externality discount will be augmented by a new component, new term, that is lambda times psi j. It used to be only two here. When I have interoperability equals to zero, the pricing formula is unchanged. When I have interoperability now, I have a further uh, externality discount. Okay. And this psi j will be composed of two components. The first one is a function of the market share uh, of platform J. And the second term will be the diversion ratio. If I have a large platform who is dominant, who has a large market share, then Xi J will tend to be negative because the first component is going to be smaller if the market, the, the demand for platform J is large. And then Xi J will tend to be negative. For small firms, uh, Xi J will tend to be positive. Now the implication will be the following. If I have a large firm 
And if I increase the interoperability lambda, then this is going to lead to a smaller externality discount, putting an upward pressure on the net fees. On the other side, if I have a small firm, increasing lambda will lead to a bigger externality discount. Well, a bigger externality discount means that a downward pressure on the net fees. Okay, now we are in a good position to do some uh, uh, the, our exercises here. Suppose we have a duopoly, okay? And an equilibrium of the duopoly with say lambda equals to zero. And I'm looking at the asymmetric equilibrium where there's a large firm, there is a smaller firm. And people are arguing that let's do some regulation and uh, add some interoperability, okay? Let's increase lambda. What is gonna be the impact of increasing lambda? Well, for the large firm, uh, increasing lambda will lead to an increase in the net fee. An increase in the net fee will imply a decrease in the market share or the demand. For the smaller firm, an increase in lambda will lead to an externality discount. So it's going to lower the net fee of the smaller firm and hence, will increase the smaller firm's uh, market demand. So it's going to equilibrate uh, uh, the market shares of the two firms. On the other side, suppose I've got, I'm looking at a symmetric equilibrium of a model. Okay. Then the firms are sharing the total market demand and the market shares will be will tend to be a small and psi will tend to be large okay and if i increase lambda now net fees will tend to go down and if i keep looking at this magic equilibrium uh, the market mm, if i look at this magic equilibrium now suddenly i'm going to have lower net fees in the market okay and then increase demand for uh, the technology at the market itself compared to the outside option. So we formalize these findings in two propositions. The first one looks at the symmetric environment. Uh, if you consider, if you compare two levels of interoperability, if you increase the interoperability, then in the symmetric equilibrium, the net fees will go down. This is just a formalization of this idea. The second one is saying that uh, the dominance will the the dominant firm's market share will go down uh, if interoperability increases. I think I've got one minute. Am I right, Greg? Yeah, one or two minutes. Um... One or two minutes. Okay. So let me then start to wrap up. Okay. So we have some additional results in the paper. We do a merger analysis where um, uh, we allow for asymmetric firms and cost savings in the merger. And we show that mergers actually can decrease uh, dominance and more easily so for larger gamma. As I mentioned earlier, we, we, we do analysis, we, we present the model with multiple sides, do, the, do some analysis with uh, a multi-sided uh, market. And we, show, we have a general existence of equilibrium result in the paper. Um, you know, there's a, big literature on platforms that, of course, we are building on. Uh, the one paper that I want to mention here is Armstrong. Mm, he, you know, his, his, he came up with a very uh, influential hoteling model of competition. And a recent contribution in this line is by Tan and Joe. Uh, they identify a very interesting effect in these in, in, in platform markets where if you increase competition, actually the total prices may also increase. So, so they call this a perverse pattern. Mm. Compared to, Tan, so Tanejo focuses attention on symmetric equilibria. So if you want to think about the market demand, what happens to the total demand in the market, or to the market shares as you increase the number of firms, uh, this approach is not going to be answering things related to dominance. 
or the Michael Schecks. Um, so let me conclude. So this, in this talk, I presented a model of platform competition in what we call net fees. And the advantages of this model include tractability and flexibility. In particular, now we can handle asymmetries relatively in a tractable way. Uh, it can accommodate demand forms that includes an outside option. Uh, and we have some analysis for policy. Increasing competition may increase dominance and increasing interoperability may alleviate dominance. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, so let's go straight over to Bruno uh, to hear the discussion. Shall I mute? Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so hello everybody. So uh, thank you for the organizers for proposing me to discuss this paper. It's a real pleasure to read again a paper by Alex. It's been some time. Uh, so uh, let me start uh, with uh, what is interesting or what I find interesting in the paper. Uh, which essentially what is really uh, attractive in this approach is that uh, it, it does provide a very tractable model. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, it's the only one that really allows to deal with asymmetries in a simple way. That, uh, of course, we can always write uh, the standard extension of the Armstrong model, with, uh, discrete choice model with asymmetric platform, but we have no result at the end. So here they get result and uh, they get some nice result. In particular, they get uh, endogenous asymmetric equilibria with symmetric firms, which is a nice property. And uh, given that uh, this is a paper that can talk about dominance, it can talk about antitrust, it can provide insight and that uh, to my view that the main strength of the paper and I would push to go more into this direction. I appreciate that this is done also in a very rigorous way with existence and uniqueness conditions. So, but uh, I think really the value is to move in this direction. Uh, I try to be brief. And so in this direction, I was missing and that was mentioned welfare analysis. So I understand from the talk that this is not so easy to do, but maybe there are other demand functions that could provide easier welfare analysis, and I was missing one reading a bit on two-sided markets because the paper starts with multi-sided market, but then all the insight are derived with one-sided market. So it's worth it remains to see whether the model can provide some insight on two-sided markets that are specific to two-sidedness. So that's really a very interesting aspect. And it's important because uh, it's been some time we've provided a model with network uh, two-sided markets and network externalities, but uh, if we want to have an impact on the policy and policy makers, we need to come with uh, something that uh, is tractable for them and which provides valuable insight. In this respect, the if I were to push the paper, the paper is still a bit too much on the type, uh, this is possible. So there is a possibility. It would be good to go on the toward under these conditions, this will happen. Uh, which is easier to read for, for economists that are uh, in decision circle or antitrust authority or consulting. So this is really the, the good aspect and there are illustration with this kind of two, two interesting results. Um, the one on increasing dominance and the one on the interoperability. Uh, the slides were much more transparent, I think, than the paper. So, uh, so you should uh, go back on the slide and because the explanation, I found it more transparent on the, during the position. So then uh, there is a drawback and uh, everybody working on that knows that. So this is uh, the concept 
has some uh, drawback. I think one of the main drawback is that uh, it's a combination of assumption on price and model. Okay, so you need to assume that gamma is uh, homogeneous. So there is an assumption on the model that is combined with a behavioral assumption on the uh, on the pricing uh, that and that allows to get this simplicity. So I uh, understand that simplicity comes with a cost or else. So this is a cost. Uh, as a comment, you should relate that to the work of uh, Greg actually and uh, Alex Le Cornier on uh, competition and utility because I think in your model it is equivalent probably. I didn't check, but looks like it is equivalent. Uh, that, uh, so that essentially the the main comment on that. Uh, I, I will leave the, the conceptual discussion for the after talk because I could talk endless about concepts and things. Just one comment on the model and the assumption of net fleets. Technically, it transforms the model into a multi-product competition model with increasing return. So every result that you obtain with network externalities here uh, can be applied in the context of multi-product with increasing return, actually. Uh, which is okay. Even interoperability, because interoperability could be interpreted as uh, learning by doing with spillovers. In a sense. So we always find some equivalent. Okay, so this is a, a way to keep in mind the thing. Uh, that's all I wanted to do, say on, on the concept. Uh, I have a couple of suggestions for the authors. Uh, three, mostly. One on the merger analysis. So the merger analysis assumes that you merge two platform and you get to one new platform, which actually has the same demand as each individual platform before, which is in the discrete choice model. It's uh, uh, there is an issue of interpretation, but what you could do is to keep the two platforms. There is no reason to shut down the platform and to make them interoperable and to ask yourself whether this type of merger would have a different effect. And maybe this type of merger may be more efficient at curbing market power than the former one. So, and this would be quite, uh, I think, easy to do. Uh, a second question I had is that uh, whether we can relate interoperability and entry. So, and so one of the question would be, uh, if we mandate interoperability, are we going to have an entry of platforms? And we know it can be good or bad. Huh? So it could be that uh, interoperability backfire by market fragmentation in a sense, especially for partial lambda. So that's something that could be looked at. Uh, and a third suggestion is that if we have a triopoly, the two small ones and an asymmetric equilibrium, the two small ones may voluntarily become interoperable. And this in order to resist and to gain market power. And this also would probably raise uh, the value of the, the small one. So these are the three suggestions I had in mind. And I will stop just on the last point, which is something that was bothering more, which is uh, when we discuss about interoperability, uh, the first thing that comes is multi-homing. So there is a direct question, multi-homing as a substitute or as a complement to interoperability. So we would like the model to help to discuss also the question of multi-homing, but I was trying to think about that and, and, and then it raised some conceptual issues. So the interaction of net fees and multi-homing, I don't know how you view it and whether you have the view on how to do it or your thought about it, uh, but that would be something that would be uh, interesting to, to, to see. Okay. And I'll stop here because I was instructed to be short. <laughs>